The scriptures we're going to proclaim tonight are James chapter 1 verses 2, 3 and 4. But when we make a proclamation, if it says, you do that, we say we do it. Do you understand? We make it personal. We line ourselves up with what the scripture says. We, we count, count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. But we let endurance have its perfect work, that we may be complete and perfect, lacking nothing. Amen. How many of you want to be complete and perfect, lacking nothing? Well, the key is endurance. All right, now we're going back to the theme that we began to deal with in the afternoon, the shaking of all things which God has predicted through his prophets. And I'm not going to go over the material we covered, just point out that God says, I will shake all things. I will shake the heaven, I will shake the earth, I will shake the dry, dry land, I will shake the sea, I will shake all nations. I will shake everything that can be shaken. The purpose being that those of us who have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken may be, as it were, filtered out from the rest of humanity. Now, this evening I want to deal with a practical response. How shall we respond if we really believe that God is going to do what he so clearly says he is going to do? What are we going to do about it? Are we going to do nothing or are we going to seek from the Bible to know what the sensible and scriptural course of action is? First of all, from what I said this afternoon, it's obvious that if we want to remain unshakable, we have to build a foundation on the word of Jesus, hearing and doing his word. So all that I'm going to say now follows out of that. In other words, in what ways shall we hear and apply the teaching of scripture? And I want to start with two verses in 2 Peter chapter 3, a, a chapter which deals with this period, the period of shaking. I'll read verses, I'll do three verses, 11 and 12. Second Peter 3 verses 11 and 12. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. We'll stop there. Peter asks a very sensible question. And he asks the right question. The question is not first and foremost, what shall we do, do? But what kind of persons ought we to be? What we are is more important than what we do. And he gives a very simple outline answer, which contains three elements. He says, first of all, in all holy conduct and godliness. Secondly, he says, looking for, and thirdly, hastening the coming of the day of God. So there are three things that he speaks about, holy conduct and godliness, looking for the coming of the day of God, and hastening the coming of the day of God. That should be our basic response. Holiness, looking for the coming of the day of God and hastening the coming of the day of God. And I will deal briefly with those. First of all, with regard to holiness, I'll just turn to one scripture, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 17 and continuing on into chapter 7, verse 1. And you need to bear in mind the chapter divisions were not in the original text. They were put in many, many centuries later 
by translators, and sometimes they obscure the sense. So we're going to start now with 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. And most of it is a quotation from the Old Testament. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So God makes a promise to be a father to all of us who fulfill his conditions. But bear in mind there are conditions stated. And the first one is, come out from among them, that's the unbelievers, not the other Christians, but the unbelievers, and be separate, be set apart to God, do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Now there are many different ways we can touch what is unclean. But one very common way, which is a problem for nearly all of us, is by our, our mental attitudes and the things we entertain in our minds. And also the things we look at. Particularly, I would have to say, by my standards, a lot of television programs are unclean. And if we deliberately expose ourselves to them, we are touching what is unclean. If we can't help it, that's another matter. Uh, I don't say by no means that we never go to movies, but very seldom can Ruth and I go to movies because they're unclean. There was a movie some years back which was really excellent. It was called Frisco Kid. I don't suppose most of you will remember it. Some of you do? Yeah, all right. Well, it was really hilarious. I mean, it was so good. And it was based on the life of a young Jewish man who was due to become a rabbi and had to go to Los Angeles from Poland. I mean, it was so exact to the thinking of Jewish people. The story was excellent and the acting was outstanding. But in the middle of it, for no necessary reason at all, there was some absolutely filthy language. It had nothing to do with the plot. And Ruth and I said, well, I'd like to see that again. And incidentally, we saw it in Florida, and I think 80% of the congregation, or the audience, not congregation, what? <laughs> well, it was like a congregation in a way, was, was at least 80% was Jewish, because we live in a thickly populated area by Jewish people. But eventually we said to one another, I don't feel free to expose the Holy Spirit in me to the kind of language that comes from that movie. That's a personal decision. But it's an example of what can mean, be meant by touching what is unclean. You don't have to. Do not expose yourself to things that will defile you mentally if you don't have to. Now I got saved in the British Army and I spent another four and a half years in the army. And you cannot help being exposed to things that are unclean in the army. I mean, British soldiers are incapable of speaking without blaspheming and swearing unless they've been saved. So I heard that day after day for four and a half years, but I did not expose myself to it. I couldn't avoid it. But I never deliberately, by the grace of God, I never deliberately exposed myself to something that will defile me. Being a preacher, I'm particularly careful because I know that if I let anything into my mind, sooner or later it'll come out of my mouth when I'm preaching. I guard my mind. Ruth will bear me witness. I do not deliberately take anything into my mind that could corrupt the word of God that God has given me to proclaim. And I suggest that all of us need to consider, you don't need to take the same exact attitude that I take, but you need to ask yourself, am I touching the unclean? 
Am I unnecessarily exposing myself to things that defile my spirit? Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the book of Proverbs says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything there is in life comes out of your heart. If you have a pure heart, you will have a pure life. And if your heart is impure, your life will be impure. That's an unalterable law that governs all human conduct. And remember, what you put into your heart determines the course of your life. You cannot have the wrong thing in your heart and live right. And you cannot have the right thing in your heart and live wrong. So what you have in your heart determines the course of your life. <coughs> I think when I was in a teacher in Africa, in Kenya, uh, I got interested in various African dialects, including one called Lurugoli, which is spoken by the Maragoli people. And I was the principal of a college for training African teachers. And I don't know why, but I walked into the dormitory of some of the students, and in the Luragoli language, I saw Proverbs 3, 23, 4, 23, up in their language. And it said, because their language is a little more simple, guard your heart with all your strength, for everything there is in life comes out of it. And I have never forgotten that. Everything there is in life comes out of your heart. If you want a good life, have a good heart, have a pure heart, have a clean heart. And if you defile yourself, ultimately you are the one that will suffer the most. Obeying the Bible is not really to be very pious, it's to have common sense. Because it works. Then God says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. God does not offer to be unconditionally father to anybody who wants it. He says, I'll be a father if you meet my conditions. And then Paul adds, therefore, at the beginning of chapter 7, and you've probably heard me say, some of you, if you find a therefore in the Bible, you need to ask what it's there for. And this, therefore, is because of the pre previous two verses. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Some things God does for us, and some things we have to do for ourselves. Now, there are many aspects of holiness which only God can do. But here is something which it is our responsibility to do. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Filthiness of the flesh, I think most of us have a pretty clear idea of some of what's entailed by that. Sexual immorality, drunkenness, anger, swearing. But what about filthiness of the spirit? I'll tell you one thing that I think that is, every form of contact with the occult is filthiness of the spirit. And many, many Christians today, often unknowingly, are involved in the occult. Many Christians read horoscopes. Is that right? Maybe not the ones here. But let me tell you that if you lived in Moses, in, in Israel, under the law of Moses, and you read horoscopes, you would have been put to death. That's God's estimate of it. I'm not going to go into a list of occult things, it's not my purpose. But I discovered in my own life that it took quite a lot of work on my part to eliminate the occult. For instance, at Cambridge, my main 
subject of study on which I wrote my fellowship dissertation was the philosophy of Plato. And many, many people admire Plato. You found many Christians. In fact, there's a form of Christianity called Neoplatonism. It's ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's a responsibility placed on us. I could spend the rest of this evening talking about how to do it, but that's not my theme. My theme is we're responsible to do it. This is not something God will do for us. This is something he tells us to do for ourselves. <coughs> then we'll go back to 2 Peter chapter 3 and look at the second requirement. <coughs> Looking for the coming of the day of God. I just want to turn to two scriptures. The first is in Titus chapter 2. Verses 11, 12, and 13. Titus 2, 11, 12, and 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And notice that Paul calls Jesus God. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the motivation for holy living is primarily looking for the coming of our Lord. I think if you analyze the teaching of the New Testament on holiness, you'll see that in almost every case, it's linked up with the expectation of the Lord's return. And personally, I believe that where the church loses the sense of expectation of the Lord's return, New Testament standards of holiness are impossible. Because I believe that is the key motivation. And then, likewise, in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. 1 John 3, 1, 2, and 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, and we are. <clears throat> Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed but what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You may tell me that you believe in the doctrine of the return of the Lord, but I want to look for the evidence in your life. Because it says, everyone who has this hope in him, that's the hope of his coming, purifies himself just as he is pure. Again, the scripture puts the responsibility on us. There are ways in which God purifies us, there are ways in which we have to purify ourselves. And God has only got one standard of purity. That's Jesus. Just as he is pure. Then going back to Second Peter again, just once more. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 12. It says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The old authorized versions used to say hastening unto. But that's not a very accurate translation. The right translation is the one that's used in the modern texts, hastening the coming of the day of God. It's not enough just to be expecting it. We have to be hastening it. How can we hasten it? The Bible tells us very clearly. Turn to Matthew 24 if you're following in the scriptures. <clears throat> The beginning of this chapter, the disciples asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And in his answer, Jesus lists a number of signs, earthquakes, pestilences, lawlessness, and so on. But he hasn't answered the question till verse 13. What will be the sign of your coming? And in Matthew 24, 13, he gives a specific answer. 
This gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. When will the end come? When the gospel of the kingdom has been proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Who is responsible to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom? I didn't hear you. That's right. So how can we hasten the coming? By proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. On the other hand, if we don't do it, we are not hastening the coming, we're delaying the coming. And if you consider all the agony and suffering in the world today, to be responsible for prolonging that longer than necessary is a terrible responsibility. But it rests on us Christians if we do not do what we can to hasten the coming of that day. And then one further answer in Revelation 19. Verses 7 and 8. This is praise that's going on in heaven. Revelation 19 verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give God glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So the marriage cannot take place until his wife, the bride, has made herself ready. So the, the state of the church affects the coming of the Lord. The Lord cannot come for his bride until she has made herself ready. <coughs> I've lived in a lot of different cultures and nations. I've never lived in any culture or nation where a bride did not take some trouble to make herself ready for her wedding day. It's universal, no matter what your color <coughs> or your language. And the same is true of the church. The church has to make herself ready. And then in the next verse, it talks about our wedding garment. Verse 8. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Notice the word. We have to wear linen. Pure, white, shining linen. And the shining linen is the righteous acts of the saints. When you and I believe sincerely in Jesus, commit our lives to him, his righteousness is imputed to us. And the scripture says we are justified, we are reckoned righteous. But that's not what the scripture is talking about here. It's talking about the righteous acts of the saints. We have to translate imputed righteousness into outworked righteousness. And that's the material from which our wedding garment will be made. It's the righteous acts of the saints. And I've permitted myself to say sometimes, according to my observation, the contemporary church has got just about enough material to make a bikini. <laughs> but that's not suitable for a marriage. So the other way in which we can hasten the coming of the Lord is by performing our righteous acts, providing ourselves with enough material to make the kind of wedding garment that we ought to wear. Now, Having said, laid that as a sort of foundation, I want to speak about four practical ways we can express our obedience to the Word of God. Number one is align with God's purposes, or purpose, better purpose. God has a purpose which is clearly revealed early on in the New Testament. God has never changed his purpose. He's working toward it consistently. And it's stated in a very familiar passage, which we call the Lord's Prayer. 
Matthew 6, 9 and 10. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the approach. That's not a prayer, that's an approach. And the first specific prayer is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is the primary objective of God? It's that his kingdom may come. And we can only align ourselves with God and with his purpose when we are aligned with the coming of God's kingdom. When everything we do is ultimately directed towards the coming of the kingdom of God. In the same chapter of Matthew verse 33 it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will be added to you. And when God says first, he means first, not second or third. In other words, our primary concern in life is to be the coming of the kingdom of God. I am na naive enough to believe that there is no other solution for the ills of humanity. We're confronted every day through the media with all the agony and the turmoil of humanity. Personally, I think people are naive who believe that man can solve that problem by himself. I was somewhat shocked when President Bush, in connection with the Gulf War, said a new order was being initiated of justice. I consider that a remarkably naive statement for a leader of a great nation. And I like to say I will not buy into his new world order. I'm not impressed by it. But man has entertained the idea for hundreds of years that he can solve his own problems, bring peace and justice to the earth. And I would say today we're probably further away from it than we've ever been at any time in human history. So I'm not ashamed to say that I believe the only ultimate realistic solution for the human race is the establishment of God's kingdom on earth under his appointed ruler, Jesus Christ. I don't feel intellectually inferior for believing that. I don't believe it's a pious superstition. I believe it's a realistic appraisal of the situation in the world and the nature of man. So I am committed to the coming of the kingdom of God. And insofar as lies in me, with many weaknesses and frailties, my life is directed toward that end. Now I happen to be a preacher I have a teaching ministry and by the grace of God my teachings are now reaching practically every nation on earth in various forms, in radio, in video, in audio tapes and in print. That's the practical expression in my life of my commitment to the coming of the kingdom of God. Now you are not called to do what I'm called to do, but you are called to do something. And first and foremost, you need to get your priorities right. It's not seek the kingdom of God when it suits you, or when you've attended to all the other things that concern you. Seek it first. And when God says first, he means first. As I was preparing this message, I got a vivid picture in my mind of the prophet Jonah. I want to turn there for a moment. You know the story of Jonah, most of you. God said, go to Nineveh and preach what I tell you. Nineveh was east and Jonah went the opposite direction. He went west. 
I think the reason why he didn't want to preach to Nineveh was that he was afraid the people would repent. And Nineveh was the number one political enemy of his people Israel. So he did not want to do anything that would forward their cause. That's my personal opinion. And the remarkable thing is when God eventually got his way with Jonah, the greatest experience of conversion recorded in history happened through him. An entire city of people believe at least 600,000 people was converted. But before that happened, Jonah had to learn a lesson. And I, I, this is very interesting, but he lived on the mountains of Galilee. And when he turned his back on God, every step he took was a step downward. He went from the mountains to the plain, from the plain to the harbor, from the harbor to the ship, and that wasn't the end. <laughs> from the ship into the sea. And let that be a warning to each and every one of us. When you turn your back on God, every step you take will be a step downward. Well, God was on Jonah's case, and when the ship took sail, it says God hurled out a storm into the sea. And all these pagans began to cry out to God and ask for help. Where was Jonah? The only one who knew the true God. The only one who had the answer. Let me read. Verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. You know what made him sleep? A bad conscience. He couldn't face life. I've met people who take refuge in sleep. I knew a lady who, if things went wrong, would sleep for 16 hours. That was her escape from life. The captain, who was an unbeliever, came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. You know, there are a lot of Jonas in the world today. They've had a call from God. They know full well what God wanted them to do. But it didn't suit them. So they've turned their back on God. And now while the world is tossing in the tempest, where are they? Down in the bottom of the ship, fast asleep. That's a tragic situation. We have some Jonas here this evening. You know God called you and you deliberately turned your back on God and who knows how you got here this evening. But I'm going to give you an opportunity later in this service to change your mind. So you can think that over. Think of it. The only man who knew the true God. The only man who had the answer. All the pagans around him were praying earnestly. And he was down there in the sides of the ship, fast asleep. What a vivid picture of multitudes of Christians today. Down in the ship, asleep because they're not willing to face reality. All right, that's number one of my recommendations. Align with God's purpose, which is the coming of his kingdom. He's never varied, he's never changed. That is his objective. Number two, cultivate endurance. We'll turn back to Matthew 24. The, the verse that I quoted was verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. 
But the verse before that says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And Jesus has been speaking about all the problems and troubles and agonies that are coming on the nations. And then he says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's the English translation, but the Greek is more specific. It says, he who has endured to the end shall be saved. In fact, it's, it's more specific than that. Jesus says, he who has endured to the end, this is the one who will be saved. The English translation doesn't bring it out sufficiently vividly. Who will be saved? The one who has endured to the end. So you're saved now. But to stay saved, you have to endure. Luke 21, which is a parallel passage. It's again the discourse that Jesus gave. He says in verse 17 and following, Luke 21, 17, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Obviously that must refer to Christians as it's people who are hated for the sake of the name of Jesus. That's one of those promises people don't put in their promise box. The next promise, maybe you do. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. Now that refers to the resurrection. Because lots of Christians who were martyred, their bodies were totally destroyed. But in the resurrection, if you make it through, you'll come out with a full head of hair. Not one hair missing. That's a guarantee from Jesus. Then he says, in your patience, possess your souls. But that really does not rem render the meaning. I'll give you my version, the Prince version. By your endurance, purchase your souls. I mean, you can check if you, if you want to. But I have looked at the words. That's my understanding of it. In other words, what is the price you have to pay for the salvation of your souls? In one word, endurance. That's right. You see, there are things we have to buy, but not with money. There's other currency with which we buy some things. In Isaiah 55, verse 1, it says, Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. You have to buy them, but not with money. In the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, the foolish who did not bring enough oil, the wise said to them, go and buy oil. But while they were buying, the bridegroom came and they missed it. But the oil we always understand to be a type of the Holy Spirit. You cannot buy the Holy Spirit with money but you have to buy in the Holy Spirit with prayer, with seeking God, with time spent in the Word. Otherwise, when your lamp runs out, you'll have nothing to refuel it with. And then, in Revelation 3, speaking to the church of Laodicea, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire and white raiment. That's not bought with money, but it's bought. And I, I understand it here in Luke, Jesus says, you have to purchase the salvation of your soul by your endurance. If you don't endure, you'll be lost. Then there was the scripture that Ruth and I proclaimed, we count it all joy when we fall into various trials. Can you say that? I mean, I know you can say the words, but is it true? See, why we proclaim that scripture is because God convinced us, convicted us that it wasn't that way with us. When we fell into various certain trials, we, I don't know that we complained, but we certain didn't, certainly didn't count it all joy. So we had to confess that as a sin. 
and we're trying to do better. But James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces endurance. I have observed in the New Testament that every test a Christian goes through ultimately is a test of faith. It may take many forms, but what is being tested is your faith. And then James says, let endurance have its perfect work. Don't stop short. Don't start to endure and then give up. Let endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I asked you before, how many of you, how many of us want to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing? What's the condition? Endurance, that's right. There's no way around it. And you know there's only one way to learn to endure. You know what that is? Enduring, that's right. <laughs> one of the words used in the old King James Version was long-suffering. And you know how you learn long-suffering? By suffering long. There's no other way to do it. I, I mean, you can laugh at that, but it's exactly correct. I know a brother who, a sister came to him for prayer, a minister, and said, brother so-and-so, pray for me, I get out of this situation, I can't stand the boss I'm working for. And he said, no, I won't pray for you, you haven't suffered long enough. <laughs> I'd like to turn to, to the end of James for a few moments. I want to point out to you how closely endurance is connected with preparation for the coming of the Lord. James chapter 5, just reading verses 7 through 11. Now the word that's used here mainly is patience. And let me offer you a little English lesson for which I make no extra charge. There are three related English words. Patience, perseverance, and endurance. They're related, but they're distinct. And all of them have their place in Christian experience. Patience is derived from the same Latin root which gives us the word passive. Patience is essentially doing nothing. And God expresses patience. Peter says that the patience of God waited in the days of Noah. God didn't do anything. For 120 years he let man go on. Lots of people could conclude that God doesn't care. That's not so. It was the patience of God. Often God exercises patience. He doesn't do anything. You say, how could he let Hitler get away with it? It's the patience of God. So patience, in a sense, in a good sense, is doing nothing. And then there's perseverance, which you can interpret as doing something and persistently doing it, going on and on and on doing it, not stopping. And then there's endurance, which is the word we're mainly dealing with. And the Greek word means remaining under. So you're under all these pressures, and endurance is remaining there. It's holding out against them, but it's not trying to escape from them. So we have these three aspects of Christian conduct. Patience, perseverance, and endurance. And they're all involved in the preparation for the coming of the Lord. So I'll read these few verses from James chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. You know, I find that for most men servants of the Lord, patience is the hardest thing to achieve. I think women are better at patience than men. It doesn't mean they're good. <laughs> but I mean, I had been a Christian at least 30 years before I realized that my besetting sin was impatience. I wasn't even convicted of it. And when I began to deal with it, dear Lord, I realized what a hold it had over me. 
All right, we're going on. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. I run into quite a lot of people today who want to claim to be prophets, but I'm not sure that they're following the scriptural pattern because there's nothing very glamorous about being a prophet according to the Bible. It's painful. It means isolation, persecution. I preached once in Africa, in Ghana, on the ministries, the ministries of the body, apostles, prophets, evangelists. I had an audience of, I think, 3,000 people. Mostly young men. It was wonderful. So after I dealt with the ministry of the apostle for quite a while, I said, how many of you would like to be apostles? Does anybody have an NIV here that I can borrow for a moment? Someone close to me? I'll give it back, I promise. Thank you very much. So, a lot of them put their hands up. I said, wait a moment. Let me read you the job description before you apply. <laughs> and I turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, which is very vivid in the NIV. This is what it says. I think it applies really to the contemporary charismatic people. I used to call it the charismatic movement, but I don't because I don't think it's moving anywhere. <laughs> it was, but it's got bogged down somewhere. All right, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. Already you have all you want addressed to the Corinthian Christians. Already you have become rich. They've had the full gospel. Did you ever hear the perversion of the full business, full gospel businessmen's movement, which is the full businessmen's gospel movement? <laughs> oh dear, I, I, I love those brothers. I've spoken for them many times. But <laughs> you have become kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings, so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. That's the New Testament description of a prophet, of, a, of an apostle. If you want the description of what it's like to be an apost a prophet, I think you can find it in Hebrews, since we're there. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. The last... Two verses. This is the prophetic ministry. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. That was Isaiah. They were put to death by the sword. 
They went about, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. How many want to be prophets? What's needed? I didn't hear you. Endurance, that's right. We'll go on now with which we were reading here. We'll go back to verse 10 of James 5. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Not an example of glamour, but of suffering. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance, notice that word, of Job, and seen the end intended by the Lord. The Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. If you go through those verses, you'll find the theme is patience, perseverance, endurance. And that's the pattern for the people of God who are preparing for the return of the Lord. I have to say that I preach these words to myself as much as to anybody here. But I, I tremble often when I hear the irresponsible way in which people are talking today about ministries and gifts. It's tough to have a ministry in the body of Christ. The more harm you do the devil, the more he'll fight against you. If you're not prepared for conflict and agony, just resign. You hear that? That's amen. <laughs> All right, we're coming to the next. This is number three. three. This is worse still. You know what it is? It's waiting. The importance of waiting is almost totally overlooked in the contemporary church. At least by the kind of people I mix with. And yet it's an essential part of our preparation for the return of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. To whom will he appear? To those who eagerly wait for him. Now some translations don't put in the eagerly, but there are, it's a double preposition in the Greek. And I think eagerly accurately represents the real meaning of it. It's not just waiting for him. But it's eagerly waiting for him. I have a friend, it's known to a few of us here, but I won't mention his name, who is a preacher. He and I have worked together in the past. And he has a rather droll way of expressing himself. And he says, when the Lord returns, he'll expect to hear something more from us than nice to have you back. If we're eagerly waiting for him, we'll have more to say than that. And then in 1 Thessalonians, a very remarkable passage. Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Which is speaking about the testimony of the unbelievers to the experience of the Thessalonian Christians. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turn from God to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, who whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So these people turn to God as a result of the ministry of Paul, to do two things. And there's no suggestion that one is more important than the other. To serve the living God and to wait for his son 
from heaven. You see, as Christians, we are called to serve, but we are also called to wait. And I've spoken to Christian ministers and workers in many places. And I sometimes ask this question, which takes more faith, to work or to wait? And never have I anybody had answered that it takes more faith to work than to wait. The real test of faith is waiting. And it's a test to which we will all be subjected because we are called to turn from idols, to serve God, to wait for his son. Give me back my NIV for a moment. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're in. This is a verse in Isaiah 64, verse 4, which is so vivid in this that I, I, I like to quote it from, from the NIV. Chapter 64, verse 4. This describes one unique aspect of the true God. It says, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. What's the one unique distinguishing characteristic of the true God? He acts on behalf of those who do one? Wait for him. Thank you. I don't. I think I probably won't need it again. <laughs> Anyhow, the exercise is good. But, uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Turn to John chapter nine, verse four, verse four. A verse that Ken quoted recently while praying with us. <coughs> I don't know whether he remembers. John 9, verse 4. Jesus says, we. That's a better translation or a better version than I. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Do you understand that? There is coming over the earth a night of darkness when work will be over. And we'll only do one thing, which is wait. That's right. But we'll wait content if we've done our job. But it will be intensely frustrating when the night descends and you say, but I should have done this. I should have done that. I should be there because it'll be too late. The night is coming when no one can work. The only thing we can do is to wait, and we don't know how long we'll have to wait. You know what I've noticed about God's trials? He hardly ever tells you, this is a trial, and if you hold out for six months, you'll be through. <laughs> and some of us get to five months and 29 days, and we give up. We didn't know we only had one more day Never give up. There's no precedent in the Bible for giving up. God determines how long the test will last, not we. You see, waiting is one of the tests to which God almost invariably subjects the servants he intends to use. I'll give you just a little list. Abraham, you're going to have a son who will be the head of a nation that will be unique in the earth. How long did he have to wait? 25 years. Meanwhile, his dear wife Sarah tried to help him and complicated things. It's interesting. 
She said, listen to me, do what I say. First of all, have a child by Hagar. And later she said, get rid of the child. That's the counsel of the flesh. It's inconsistent. Tells you to do one thing and later cancels it. But Abraham became the man he was by waiting. He had to watch his wife past the age of childbearing and still wait. It amazes me that Abraham is so highly rated in the Bible. But what did he do? Well, essentially, he was a prosperous cattle farmer. And he wandered around the area to the east end of the Mediterranean, looking after his flocks and his herds. He did nothing very dramatic. Until the time came that he offered up, or was willing to offer up his son Isaac. I've often asked myself, what was it in Abraham that caused God to esteem him so highly that he was called a friend of God? And I'm not sure that I really know the answer. But I think one way he earned God's favor was by waiting. Some of you are going to forfeit God's favor if you don't wait. And then there was Joseph. I love the passage in Psalm 105 that speaks about Joseph. I think I can identify with this to some extent from my own experience. Psalm 105 verse 17 and following. God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. His soul came into irons. Somebody said the iron came into his soul too. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. See, that's a test. The Lord gives you a glorious promise. Tremendous. And after that, everything goes the opposite way. Instead of becoming the ruler over your brethren, you end up in a jail in Egypt. And I can't think of a worse place to be in jail than Egypt. What was God doing? Testing him. What was the test? Waiting. And then if you want to look at others, Moses. It says in Numbers 12 verse 3, Moses was the meekest man on earth. How did Moses learn meekness? For waiting, by waiting 40 years. Somebody asked another preacher friend of mine, why did God keep Moses waiting 40 years? And the answer was because he couldn't do it in 39. <laughs> God will not finish until the test is complete. When Moses first thought he could deliver Egypt, he was a, Israel out of Egypt, he was a very arrogant young man. Forty years later, he was the meekest man on earth. And no one except Jesus has ever exercised such authority as Moses exercised. So if you want to have authority, you know what you need to cultivate? Meekness. God cannot trust his authority to the arrogant, the proud, the self-asserted. We had a, a prophetic word that said that in so many ways. You know the condition for promotion in the kingdom of God? It's very easy. It's abase yourself. Everyone who abases himself will be exalted. But on the other hand, everyone who exalts himself will be Abased, that's right. You have the choice. That's an unalterable law that governs the universe. People talk about breaking God's laws. That's not true. We don't break God's laws. God's laws break us if we break them. And then let's think just about David for a moment. 
another young man who was given tremendous promises of God. And he spent the next, I don't know how many years, I think probably about 15 years, living, as he said himself, like a dead dog or a partridge on the mountains, running away from the man whom he was to succeed as king. Why does God permit that? In fact, why does God ordain that? What is he looking for? In one word, I didn't hear you. Endurance, that's right. You cannot bypass endurance. You know whom I'm speaking to at the moment? Me. You cannot bypass endurance and enter into the promises of God. You can come so far, but the completeness is only through endurance. And just when it seems impossible to hold out, that's the time to hold out. Don't give in. I would like to say that to several of you individually. You're in the test. You're doing all right. Just hang in there. Don't back out. Don't give up. God is faithful. I've been asked sometimes if I had a message to leave for posterity, what would it be? I always say I can give it to you in three words. God is faithful. I'll tell you another thing about waiting. It causes us to realize more and more our dependence on God. I can't do anything. I can't make it happen. I don't know when he's coming. I just depend on him. I don't know whether you ladies ever have problems in your house, but we do in Israel. Sometimes our electricity fails for reasons we, we can't analyze. And we're in the middle of cooking something or somebody's doing the ironing. And we phone and we eventually catch up with our electrician. It's midday. I'll try to be there by 4 p.m. So what do we do for four hours? We wait. And by the end of four hours, you know, we won't know one thing. We need the electrician. <laughs> We're dependent on him. So waiting causes us to realize in an altogether new measure our dependence on Jesus. All right. Finally, brethren. And I tried to do better than Paul who said, finally, brethren, and wrote two more chapters. <laughs> and I think it's necessary to say this because what I've said in many ways has been hard to take. But the fourth recommendation I have <coughs> is cultivate a positive attitude and expectation. You know, somebody said everybody is born either an optimist or a pessimist. And I know full well what I was born. I was born a pessimist. Furthermore, I was brought up to be a pessimist. I mean, my parents were good people, but in my home, if you weren't worrying, you should be worrying about the fact you weren't worrying. <laughs> And I was saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and had a ministry. But I had not overcome pessimism. And the expression it took in my life was depression. And although other people were getting saved, I was struggling ceaselessly against this dark cloud that settled down over me. And I did everything. I mean, I knew the scriptures fairly well. I know that you have to reckon yourself dead. And I reckoned myself dead so many times, it just didn't have any meaning. But it didn't solve the problem. And then one day I was reading Isaiah chapter 61 verse 3. And I read, in place of the spirit of heaviness, the garment of praise. And when I read the phrase, the spirit of heaviness, the Holy Spirit said to me, that's your problem. 
And I suddenly realized I wasn't dealing with myself. It wasn't my mental attitudes. It was a person that was tormenting me day and night. And I realized he was a person that had known me from childhood. He knew my every weakness. He knew just when to attack me. Furthermore, I realized that it was what we would call a familiar spirit. It was a spirit that had come down through my family. I identified exactly the same condition in my father. And I called on the name of the Lord and I was delivered from that demon. Oh yes, I was saved. I spoke in tongues. I preached the gospel. But I needed to be delivered from a demon. I was so ashamed of that that I didn't tell anybody for 10 years. And then the Lord forced me out into the open by confronting me with a demon-possessed woman in front of my pulpit on Sunday morning. And I had just been preaching that no matter what the devil does, God has the last word. There was this woman writhing like a snake in front of the pulpit. The same woman that used to play the piano for our worship meetings. And I knew I either had to prove it or stop saying it. And that was when I was thrust out into the open. And that woman was delivered. But it took me 10 years from the time I was, I was delivered myself before I was willing to face the issue in public. But why I say that is because once I was delivered, God showed me he had done for me what I could not do for myself. But he would not do for me what I could do for myself. And he showed me I had to change the way I thought. Every time a negative suggestion or reaction came to my mind, I had to meet it with something positive out of the scripture. And that did not happen overnight. It took at least three years. But by the end of that time, I was no longer a pessimist. So I understand what's involved. I would say, as a matter of fact, if you'll forgive my saying it, as a Britisher to Britishers, one of the main problems of Britain is pessimism. The British are more prone to pessimism than any other major nation that I've dealt with. I think it's something, it's a spiritual influence somewhere. Anyhow, let's not get involved in that. <laughs> I think I ought to say this. I will be teaching on deliverance from demons in Kensington Temple later this month. If you really have a serious need, come then. and We'll do something for you. All right, now let's just come to this business of having a positive attitude and close. Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. So we have two options, and only two. We can overcome, or we can be overcome, but there's nothing in between. And when we're confronted by evil, there's only one thing that's strong enough to overcome evil, and that is good. We cannot take a negative attitude. We cannot simply say, it's not my problem. We have to actively practice that which is good. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. And Romans 8, 35 and following says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As, <clears throat> as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's pretty negative teaching, isn't it? Some people object to negative teaching. They say, brother, be positive. But the negative is also true. People who sell phony shares in the stock market are very positive. 
that they're dishonest. I believe as Christians we have to face the negative. We cannot close our eyes or avert our heads. There is trouble ahead. I believe there's much more trouble ahead than most of us can even comprehend at the moment. But that doesn't mean we have to be pessimistic. What is Paul's comment? Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What is all these things? There's a list. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. And then Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. I once asked the Lord what it meant to be more than conqueror. And I felt the answer he gave me was this. To be more than a conqueror means that you go into a trouble, overcome it, and come out of the trouble with more than you went in with. You've taken spoil. First John chapter 4. Um, only two more scriptures. First John chapter 4 and verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, all the forces of evil, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Actually, it's incredibly stupid of the devil ever to think that he could take God on. I mean, we can't absorb the stupidity. The God who created the whole universe and keeps it in perfect order and some created being challenges this God. There was an American philosopher who said about the devil, he's a consummate ass. I'm not using empty words, I'm just pointing out it's the height of stupidity what the devil has done. But he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. I'd like you to say that after me because I think you need to say it. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Say it again. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Now, if you would like to do this, find somebody near you, turn to them, look them in the eyes and say, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. All right? He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. All right. You know why? Because it's, why I do that is because it's pretty easy to look up to God and not be embarrassed. But when you've got to look somebody right between the eyes and say it, that, that gives you some idea of whether you really mean it. All right. One other scripture and we close. Revelation 21 verse 7. Revelation 21 verse 7. He who in overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I have searched the New Testament. I cannot find any promise there except for those who overcome. And you only have two options, either overcome or be overcome. So we, all of us, each of us, has to make up our mind. I can overcome. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But I have to make my mind up. I have to meet the conditions. Now I just think I need to apply what I've been saying very briefly. I felt when the Lord gave me this message that there would be some Jonas here tonight who've heard the call of God and refused it. And maybe where you've been is down in the sides of the ship fast asleep. But by some act of God's providence you got here tonight and you've listened to the description and you realize that is me. I'm a Jonah. I'm running away from God. 
And every step I've taken since I turned my back on God has been a step downward. But now, tonight, I want to turn back to God. I want to acknowledge my rebellion and turn back to Him and submit my life to Him. Now, Christians, will you be praying? If there's any Jonas here tonight, we want to tell you that God loves you still. We love you. We want to help you. But you've got to make a decision. If you want to come back to God tonight, do just one simple thing. Wherever you are in this auditorium, stand to your feet right now. Say, I'm a Jonah. I've been running away from the Lord. But I want to come back. Wherever you may be, I am quite sure there's at least one here tonight. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Another Jonah. Bless you. I said I was sure there was a woman here tonight. Just keep standing, because this is an important moment. There's another. God bless you, my dear sister. God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. Now don't stand unless you answer that category. You have heard the call of God and you've run away. And now you want to come back. Praise God. God showed me there would be Jonas here tonight. Listen, I want you to do something else. This won't be altogether easy, but it makes the difference. I want you to get out of your pew and by whatever means possible, come down and stand in front of the pulpit here. All right? Please. You've got to move out from where you are, you understand? Just to stay in one position. Now, Brother Ken, where are you? Uh, if we have counselors here, well, I'll tell you what, I think we need to send them into another room. I didn't know we'd get this number of people. I just want to tell you that it makes me very happy to see you here tonight. And I want you to know God loves you. He's never given up on you. You understand? You may have given up on him, but he has never given up on you. Thank you, Lord. I would like all of you to just say this simple prayer after me. Well, we'll wait a moment or two as people come. Now, I know that some of you need to get out. You're, it's late, but try and hold fast if you can. Don't be embarrassed if you have to go. Ruth, come stand with me. Now, very simple prayer. Praying to Jesus, not to me. I'll give you the words. You say them after me. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry that I turned my back on you and went my own way. Tonight I repent. I turn back to you. I submit myself to you. And I ask you to have your way in my life. Take me as I am and make me what you want me to be. I want you to say those last words again. Take me as I am and make me what you want me to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, Ken, is there a place to which they can go if they want to? Would you show them how to go? Now, while they are being directed, I just want to give one further opportunity. If there is anybody here tonight, you've never been born again. You've never become part of God's new creation. And you want to be part of that new creation. Uh, th those people that came forward as Jonas, would you go out that way? Christians, will you be praying for these? Some of us know from experience it's hard to come back to God when you've turned away. But tonight is their night. God showed me, put that bid in about Jonah because there are going to be some here tonight. 
Now, we're not going to prolong this, but if you have never been born again, you do not know for sure that your sins have been forgiven for the sake of Jesus. You've never personally yielded your life to him as Savior and confessed him as Lord. You don't know the peace that comes through the forgiveness of sins. But you would like that tonight. Would you just do the same as the other did, others did? Would you just stand to your feet wherever you are? Don't be embarrassed. Do not be embarrassed. It would be a tragedy if you were to go out of here tonight without having come to know Jesus personally. We're not going to prolong this. I have a feeling there's at least one person and you're struggling. Christians, let's pray for a moment, shall we? Lord, if there is somebody here tonight who needs to be born again, but is held back by some satanic pressure, by a spirit of fear, whatever it may be, in your name, Lord Jesus, we loose them now from anything that holds them, that they may be free to make their own decision. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you want to receive Jesus, you can. All you have to do to indicate is to stand to your feet. We're not going to prolong this. I have a, such a strong feeling there is somebody here. Oh, there's somebody standing. God bless you. We couldn't have gone home without you. Now, is there a, some mature Christian here who can counsel that dear lady? I'd like you to go back to her. Do we have somebody? Yes, all right. Would you see the lady that's standing? Go back and talk to her. Pray with her and help her. Now, how many of us can say thank you, Jesus?